I have lived through some very terrible things in my life, some of which actually happened. <laughs> I love that Mark Twain quote because it reminds me of my mother. It's the sort of thing my mother would say. My mother also used to say, Stuart, comb your hair forward because you've got a very big forehead. <laughs> she used to also say, Stuart, speak slowly. People don't understand you. So, Mum, I'm working on both of these things today. <laughs> in the book, All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten, written by Robert Bowden, the author recounts for us the story of how one day he's left with a group of children to look after. So he decides to play a game called Wizards, Giants, and Dwarves. And the purpose of the game is not only just to keep the children busy, but to see what group they belong to. So when all the kids were running around in chaos, there was one little girl that walked up to Robert Bowden, pulled him by the trouser legs and said, where do the mermaids stand? <laughs> well, there are no mermaids. To which she replied, oh yes, I am one. You see, she didn't relate to the category of wizard, giant, or dwarf. She knew her category, which was mermaid. And she wasn't about to leave the game and go over and stand against the wall where a loser might stand. She intended to participate wherever mermaids fit into the scheme of things. When I first heard that story years ago, it struck me with such impact. Firstly, because I knew that if it had been me at that age, I would have just surreptitiously slipped in with the dwarves. I wouldn't have wanted to draw any attention to myself, and I certainly wouldn't have even dreamed of getting in with wizards or giants. The other thing that struck me is how few of us are, declared to, are prepared to stand up and declare who we are in the face of wizards and giants. That perhaps they represent those that we feel that we don't quite measure up to. Or maybe they represent society's norms, or the categories where we feel we should fit. When I was 12, I came with my family from Scotland to South Africa. And about three days after I arrived, I had experienced a really traumatic experience at the school cities day. Now, this is a day where you can come to school just dressed in normal clothes. So I exited from the school bus that day, dressed the epitome of small town Scottish 1970s fashion, which was high-waisted pants, bell bottoms, <laughs> platform shoes, and one look around at what everyone else was wearing, and I pretty knew that I had made the fashion faux pas to beat all the fashion faux pas. And if you're trying to get the visual, think of the rock band Bay City Rolls at that time. <laughs> I know, right? I looked to the rest of the school as if I just parachuted in from Mars. <laughs> and the story doesn't finish there because my briefcase was an old, my, my suitcase with my wall, but it was like that. My case for school was like an old fashioned briefcase that was more suited to a 50 year old lawyer than a first year high school student. <laughs> and it stuck out like a sore thumb in a sea of fat. I was like a mermaid. <laughs> and I'd love to tell you that day that I held my head up high and I flipped my mermaid tail and I swam comfortably into school. But I didn't. You see, the single most critical thought that people have about themselves is that they're different. But not in a positive way, but in some negative, alienating way. And I was no different. And I spent the rest of the day hiding in the school toilets feeling quite ashamed and calling myself names like loser and weirdo. I'm just going to get some water. Nerves will do that to you. They said you could be real and vulnerable to Ted, so that's not <laughs> So I was invited to speak at a conference, and this time I was appropriately dressed, thank goodness. So, so far, so good. And I was talking about a communication tool called the Joe Harry Window. And as I started to explain this to the audience, I became acutely aware that I had just pitched this completely wrong. And with that thought, my anxiety soared, my confidence plummeted, I lost my place several times, 
and everything that could go wrong seemed to go wrong and to add insult to injury. At the end of the presentation, the master of ceremony says to the audience, uh, I don't know if you got that, but there's something about a window. <laughs> and he wasn't talking about the one that I wanted to jump on. <laughs> and with all of this came this feeling of self-criticism, you should have done better, you should have known better. Uh, and because I thought that I had done so badly, I felt mortified. And what followed was about 24 hours of brutal, self-lacerating despair, where I also made a mental commitment never ever to speak in public again. <laughs> and as I stand before you, clearly I can't trust it. <laughs> There was a book that was written called The Inner Game of Tennis by a guy called Tim Galway. Until Tim Galway was a tennis player and then later a coach, he became very interested in exploring the relationship between what happens in the mind of a player and what happens physically on the court. And what Galway said is that in every game there's an inner game and there's an outer game. The inner game takes place within the mind of the player against the obstacles of nervousness, lapse of concentration, self-condemnation, and that it's played to overcome all the obstacles of the mind which inhibit excellence in performance. And that for us to maximize our potential, we need to win both the outer game and the inner game. And this is not limited to great sportsmen because we all regularly engage in self-talk. And that's what was happening to me at that presentation. So while I'm talking to the audience, I had this voice that's screaming at me, how bad do you have to be when there's someone sleeping in the front row? <laughs> You're not interesting enough. You're not smart enough. You're not enough. The fact that the organizers tell me afterwards that my speech was very well received by the audience, it was one of the best, doesn't even register. My critical, the critical inner voice or negative self-talk is a pattern of destructive thoughts that we have towards ourselves. And the nagging voices that make up this internal dialogue is at the root of much of our dysfunctional and self-critical and self-destructive behavior. And you know what the hardest thing about the voice in your head is? Is that it speaks to you using your own face and your own voice. So it doesn't say, you are terrible presentations. It says, I am terrible presentations. And some of us believe that such self-critical talk is helpful, that somehow it safeguards us against laziness or making mistakes, and that the harder that we are in ourselves, the somehow better we'll be. But the opposite is true. And let's think about it. I mean, there's a huge difference between if we say something to ourselves like, don't eat anything fatty, and fatty, don't eat anything. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we go about changing our thinking? Well, one of the ways is for us to start to become aware of the many mistakes that our mind makes on a daily basis, and we're not even aware of it. And we call these thinking errors. And I'm going to share with you three that I'm particularly good at. The one is catastrophizing. Now this is when a person unhealthily focuses on an error to such an extent that a relatively small mistake starts to feel like a catastrophe. My presentation. <laughs> Personalization is another one. And this is where we personalize what happens to us, even though it's something that's not even in our control. So the guy who's sleeping in the front row, well, you know, maybe it tells me more about him than it does about me as a presenter. Another thinking error is what we call polarized thinking. And this is the fallacy of thinking that things are either right or they're wrong. It's either all or it's nothing. And this is a false dichotomy because reality often lies in the sizable middle ground between the two extremes. And there's many examples of this. So maybe in your mind you have two categories of co-workers. Good ones and bad ones. Or maybe when you view a project, you view it in terms of it was either a success 
or it was a failure. And this black and white thinking is not realistic because we don't recognize all the shades of gray. And apparently, if you can identify 50 of them, you can have a really block. <laughs> So the way that we think about things seriously affects where we are. Now, there's no right or wrong thinking, but there is helpful thinking and there's unhelpful thinking. So here's the rub. I have been dealing with negative self-talk, uh, thinking errors, and all this associated anxiety for as long as I can remember. And you know what? I'm still catastrophizing. I'm still personalizing. I'm still polarizing. I have my voices, I have my mother's voices, and I'm pretty darn sure if I really listen very carefully, I really hear some of your voices. <laughs> but what I have come to discover is to let the critical voice be and just accept it. I can't stop the thoughts. You know, in the Buddhist view, they say you can't control what pops into your head. For that all arises out of some mysterious void. And then we spend a lot of our time partially judging ourselves for feelings that we had no role in summoning in the first place. I've also become interested in mindful meditation. And I know some of you will think, well, that's a bit of a waste of time, like alcohol, free beer, and kissing after sex. Forget it. <laughs> but here's the thing. Research has proven that mindful meditation reduces activity in the part of the brain which is associated with the critical mind. And mindfulness is just becoming aware of what is going on on our mind right at this moment. Anger, <coughs> sadness, boredom, it's for lunch, and a critical voice. And not getting carried away with it. Mindfulness allows us to examine our self-hatred. Someone said to me the other day, Ooh, isn't that a bit extreme, self-hatred? And I was reminded of a coaching session, I'm just going to grab the letter. I was reminded of a coaching session not so long ago when someone described themselves as fat, ugly, and stupid. And I thought, whoa, you wouldn't even hang out with people like that. You wouldn't even be near them, and yet that's the level of brutality that when we have when we speak to ourselves. Mindfulness. It's all about leaning into the problem by becoming aware of it. Which is pretty radical for most of us when you consider that our normal reflex is to buy something, or eat something, or avoid it completely, or open a bottle of wine, or take another anti-anxiety medication. If I was to ask you right at this moment to become aware of how you're sitting, and really feel and experience how you're sitting. You probably start to become aware of something that you were not even conscious of a few seconds ago. Some of you will have already adjusted your posture ever so slightly. Others are going, there's no way I'm moving because he's meant to be. <laughs> but that's what happens, is just by drawing attention to how you're sitting encourages the changes. And that's what meditation does. Meditation allows us to watch our thoughts without attaching to them, without breathing life into them, without judging them, without reacting. And then we start to realize that the thought, I am a weirdo, is just a thought. And whilst it might be your thought, it doesn't describe you. And we also start to notice that thoughts aren't solid. They appear in our awareness and we watch them in a large projection screen in our mind, to which we're the audience. So in meditation we watch and we observe while staying anchored in reality and we start to realize that without the juice of your attention, they simply disappear without a trace. As Eckhart Tolle said, the voice, what a liberation to realize that the voice in my head is not who I am. Who am I then? The one who sees that. You see, the mind is like an ocean, and at the surface there is a raging storm. But the deeper that we go down, the deeper a person goes down, the calmer that it gets. And in order for us to know who we truly are, 
And to silence our inner critic, we've got to get to the bottom of the ocean. But when we get there, we realize there are no wizards, giants, and dwarfs, because they don't exist. But what we will find is you. Some peace, some quiet, and some other wonderful things. I'm thinking water. Fuck my own stuff. Thank you. Thank you.